didn't Costa Farms just release this? And Costa Farms released this a long time ago. You're next. And the Rio, while we're at it, it's basically a Brazil. Wait, is this an Adansonia? Okay, I don't want to touch it. Just, yep, take it from right here. Go around and I'll just uh, uh, get rid of it. Ew, 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 ew. Ew, 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 ew. Oh, hi everyone. I was just sorting through all of my rare plants canceled in 2022, as I do, and I'm sure most of you do too. I just gotta throw these out and I'll be right back. Before we go on to the meat of the video, I'd once again like to tell you about Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. When I poke my head out of this verdant enclosure, I'd like to go somewhere that is not here. I could easily venture to Quebec though, and probably speak French to people that already know English. It is the effort that counts. As a sneak peek, here are a few French phrases I've learned that relate to this video. Les plans penachures sont terribles. Cache ton argent. Ne pas caresser le ringnal. The lessons are designed by language teachers to show you how to converse in real life scenarios. So it's kind of New Year's still. I think if all your other New Year's resolutions have fallen through already, here's a second chance to do something else. For me, social media was an aspiration I had a few years ago. This year, I want to spend my waking hours judiciously and carve out some time to learn French. I want to talk to more people in this world. I want to network, and I think that this would help. Click the link below to receive 60% off your subscription. And there's more languages than just French, so what language will you be learning? Comment down below. Hello everyone. Today I wanted to take you through my profound journey with rare plants. Personally, I don't believe in rare plants, so just assume I'm using air quotes every time I say it. I don't want my hands to cramp up and look like a malfunctioning reef crustacean in the middle of this. I will also include my perspective on why this phenomenon culminated both individually and societally. My experience, like many others in the houseplant community, began in 2020. From that moment on, in respect to rare plants, I'd like to take you through the ups and downs and downs and down. Okay, you get the point. I'll tell you everything, okay? Furthermore, I'd just like to cover why I find it to be an odd construct in the context of this community's assumed values. And if you're wondering about the thumbnail, the reason I did it is because Olivia Rodrigo's face on the cover of the album Sour is exactly how I feel about the subject matter. <laughs> that, that thumbnail was hell on earth. Actually, it was earth on hell because it's getting pretty bad here. I think you should like the video if I almost swallowed a foreign object to serve pop culture realness. Okay, my journey with rare plants. We've got a lot to cover. I'm going to do the first stretch of the video chronologically, and then we'll talk about things as I see fit. I've been growing plants since I was five, if you're new here, and I do not recollect anyone caring so much about philodendrons and aeroids in general as I do now. Intense botanical interest of the foliar persuasion never lent itself to ubiquity, so to speak. I have been to a lot of plant-oriented exhibitions in my life, but I have never been made aware of any aeroid shows in my area pre-2020. There were garden shows that expressed interest in temperate plants because I live near Canada, but no Mises. It's actually my dying wish to pet a moose. Emphasis on the dying. I've been to my fair share of orchid shows. Orchids definitely had a cult following. And my theory is because orchid flowers kind of look like faces and people are lonely, but not lonely enough to pursue an amorphophallus just yet. African violet shows were another category. Riveting. 
Okay, I'm being a little bit dramatic. There are other Gisneriads there that compel interest, just not African violets. I just think they're really mundane. They're objectively boring, historically. The Aeroid community had their most extensive following in South Florida, mostly because that is the only place where many of these plants can grow to maturity without the need of a conservatory and are very difficult to flower outside of a truly tropical climate. And if you want a hybrid plant, you want to cross these and create something like a Philodendron Glorious, you need a lot of light, a lot of heat, a lot of humidity, and a lot of space, which is something that is very difficult to come by in the North. Now, don't get me wrong, people outside that niche aeroid group in South Florida have been growing aeroids for generations. Baby boomers have reared Pothos and Monstera in the same crusty, dusty pots since Cindy Lauper blessed us with girls wanna have fun. Granted, they did not possess the same unwitting obsession that eclipses rational cognition in the prefrontal cortices of millennials today. Yes, finally is mine, finally is mine. Oh my god, yes! I believe it was a relationship of sentiment. People cared more about the temporal composition of the plant than the monetary. Ah, uh, Gladys, do you remember when that feral cat climbed down from our attic and had kittens in our bed? Yes, honey, it was the same day we got that philodendron cutting from your great aunt whose funeral we selfishly didn't go to on behalf of our timeshare in Boca. As far as very niche plants that require detailed care, I've literally seen Monstera growing in outdoor soil before. I was like, why is this pot so heavy? And then I realized this Monstera was literally growing in a chunk of clay. All I'm saying is growing plants in pimped out Ikea cabinets under disgustingly overpriced grow lights in Lechuza Pond did not materialize until our newly found interest in aeroids. I mean, if we look back, no vivariums, no terrariums, but there were sanitariums. That is until someone discovered a cure for tuberculosis. I don't know, they sounded nice. Like a little mycobacterium reprieve every now and again. To put it bluntly, no one had the 35 forms of philodendron varicosum tattooed on their back, nor did they threaten to break up with their significant other over a philodendron. I don't know if the scenario was real or not, but I'm guessing the boyfriend didn't want to take his chances. It is the Dr. Phil episode we all want, but don't deserve. As a personal example of this, my mother grew philodendrons above her kitchen cabinets for 30 years before I told her they were golden pothos. Everyone, look around you. You probably see a plant of some sort. This is a more garish example. Specialty aeroids did not stay niche for long because of protein spiked RNA receptacles. Thank you so much for that, nature. Really appreciate it. However, to be historically accurate, the houseplant community consolidated itself into a respective social media concept in 2016. Purportedly, because millennials are fiscally inclined to propagate instead of procreate. I don't have an example for Procreate. This is a Christian channel. There are too many aeroids in here to Vogue. So how was I embroiled in this leafy cauldron of neurosis? My initial encounters with philodendronous rage were on Reddit. Initially, I was surprised at the going rates of these plants because I knew they were worth the dirt in which they were conceived. And to anyone watching this, you are also worth the dirt in which you were conceived. And then I had an epiphany. I'm a planty person. I can do this. I can grow these aeroids and subsequently flip them. But not this one. It's un- Rare. I've sold an obscene amount of philodendron rio before they started becoming worthless. And somewhere in this convolution, I decided to film it. And that's how this channel was born. In doing so, I did not want to potentially dump my money into the abyss. So naturally, I obtained my propagules by means of trade on Reddit. And I'd like to tell you about the rare plant interactions I had there. Some were savory and some were not. 
Overwhelmingly, the experiences were tarnished by lying or ghosting for, from my perspective, no quantifiable reason. So I'm going to provide two prominent examples and we will draw conclusions from those. Myself and another planty person were exchanging Hoya cuttings. They agreed to trade and then I tried to move on to shipping details and they ghosted me. Now you're probably thinking, Nick, you're being insensitive. A meteor could have crashed through the roof of their house and killed all of their variegated squirrels, and that's why they're not responding. Here's the thing about Reddit, if you've never been on it. You can easily click on their profile and see all of their activity. Every comment, every post, since they made their account. So I can see they're on Reddit trading strawberry shakes for obliquas while ignoring me. So let me ask you, what is the point of this? If you don't want to trade, that's fine. But just tell me so I can go on and look for that plant elsewhere. Next example, and my personal favorite. The individual that backed out because their friend was plant collecting in Florida and found the same Hoya the day after we confirmed the trade. Friend. It's always the friend. My friend just killed someone and they're wondering if soda water would get blood out of a Snuggie. I mean, they could just buy another one, but like, it's my favorite. I mean, it's their favorite Snuggie. Th they got it from my, their grandma when we, I, she, it went to um, Colorado. Normally I would give people the benefit to the ridiculous doubt, but due to the temporal context of this situation, it was almost impossible. The date was May 28th, 2020. And I remember this date because it made the inexplanation so monumentally absurd. If your memory fouls you or your subconscious has blocked it out of your conscious, we were in full swing COVID meltdown. You probably recall the many classy events that happened in this era. People throwing down in Costco over Charmin Ultrasoft. People were chugging Clorox in the vain attempt to avoid getting infected. People were bleaching their hair in their bathrooms out of abject boredom and despondency. TikTokers decided this was the time to go to Saddle Ranch. Trips to Mexico. It really showed the altruistic way that Americans come together in the face of adversity. Bringing this all together, I find it very hard to believe that her friend was out plant shopping at this time. Based on these examples and other ones I have experienced, I can deduce that people are exceedingly non-confrontational in this community and will do anything to avoid uncomfortable discourse. I believe this culminates into an etiquette of sorts of inconsideration and dishonesty. Just a reminder, I have had positive ones too, so thank you to those people. The reason I believe this behavior is so widespread revolves around the concept of escapism. As as we said, the size of this community really compounded during the pandemic. At the time, there were a lot of things going wrong with the world and in people's personal lives. A lot of the things we were experiencing could not be dealt with or solved on an individual basis, so you were pretty much helpless to whatever was going on in the world at that point. Ultimately, I think it drove people into online spaces that were perceivably better, such as the houseplant community. The key word there is perceivably. The problem is we are inherently flawed individuals and no space we ever create, whether it is virtual or physical, will be perfect. However, you can feign perfection and create a utopian society by silencing anyone that criticizes it or raises any concerns. Or I would say in this community, create the expectation that nobody says anything that is not explicitly positive beyond literal theft, I would say. Because of this, negative behavior goes unchecked and the idealistic space that people thought they were creating actually becomes worse than the one they were trying to escape. Beyond this, I've heard people say, we're so unlike the beauty community because they're toxic. If you're going around telling people that you're not toxic, you're probably the toxic one and not in the Britney Spears sparkly bodysuit type way. This behavior is adjacent to those that run around telling people that they're smart. If someone tells you they're smart, run opposite direction. Get on a train, move to Ecuador, dye your hair in a gas station bathroom, and to become an alpaca farmer. Don't talk to anyone that's not a camelid. No, I don't know if they have Garnier Nutrice in South America. Now that you're living in the foothills of Chimborazo, 
and you strapped a router to your guanaco, I have something very important to tell you. If you have to elevate your character or moral status by means of juxtaposition, you probably lack the qualities you're trying to embellish. Do you know they have like a hundred types of potatoes in Ecuador. Moving on. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the incongruence between people's socio-political beliefs in the community and the construct of rare plant ideology. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've come to understand this is a fairly left-leaning community. Okay, it is a very left-leaning community. For example, the Reddit houseplant sub is pride-themed for some reason. LGBTQ plants. Was there a meaning I missed? Your pothos is dying? I would try sleeping with someone of the same gender and it should perk right up. We also have a Plantifa Instagram page. I'm not really sure what that entails. I'm sure there's other content that's congruent to this. I wouldn't know. I only go on social media to post. The point I'm trying to make is these ethics and ideals do not align with the aggressive, elitist, capitalistic nature of accumulating rare plants or manifesting an informal hierarchy to align these plants based off of perceived superiority. Guys, we're egalitarian in this community, but my variegated Monstera adansonii is more equal than your unvariegated one. Does that make sense? Okay, good people battling each other on eBay to see who can win the $1,000 leaf so they can post it on Instagram to perpetuate an idea of exclusivity and wealth. Definitely doesn't scream socialism, but okay. While no one explicitly divulges the motives behind these posts, most of us can see the unwritten dialogue laced within them. People post these unicorn plants, if you will, which I generally see as a solicitation for positive feedback. But let's be realistic, the people are more entranced by the plant than they are you. Like some of my more unfortunate trading situations, people see you strictly as a means to an end. Cutting. Or mid-cutting or a node, or the whole plant. You know what I mean? They don't care about you. They care about the plant you're holding. Ultimately, whoever possesses the most unattainable and expensive plant gets the most praise, which is inherently a very avaricious and consumerist dynamic. Why do people who support socialism rally against capitalism? One of the main reasons is it puts profit above human lives. If you've been here for a long time, remember I talked about the children getting sucked into the loom? Yes, that. In reference to trading, sometimes I feel like I was being sucked into the loom. Moral of the story, capitalism is still capitalism, whether or not you dress it up with leaves. This dynamic is actually nothing new. Harkening back to the Victorian era, and their looms, as I have highlighted. Plant fever was in full swing, and owning virtually unattainable plants was a status symbol for the high class. Aristocrats would arrange expeditions and pay people enormous sums of money to go to East Asia and South America to collect orchids perched upon sheer rock faces, trees, and sporadically the contemptuous digits of a northern snub-nosed macaque. Okay, I made up the last one but it was very treacherous. The plants would then be returned if the explorers didn't already die in a cavernous death, and the rich people would sit in their glass houses and ferneries and have their pictures taken against the poached Pathia petalums. It's like the 19th century version of what we're pretending not to be doing now. We just love emulating the English aristocracy. We should definitely bring back the daguerreotype though. Beyond the covetous interest in unique and uncommon plants of the English high society, and a few isolated contemporary examples, this lens of horticulture was an emergent concept to most people today. And never have we, as millennials and older Gen Zs, experienced this phenomenon in ubiquity. Most of us were not raised to see plants as status symbols, equitable to say, luxury products. For example, the names of plants associated with rarity are referred to in the same fashion as you would designer backs. People generally don't say, Monstera obliqua. They say, I got an obliqua. The same way people don't say Hermes Birkin, they say, I just wrestled this Birkin from an old lady on Park Avenue. Similarly, I'm sure very few Birkin bags and obliquas have not been posted to the internet in some way. 
Now, why is the community generally not aware of this? Well, I have a hypothesis. I believe what obscures the perception of this phenomenon are themes associated with traditional indoor gardening. Traditional as in the crusty Thanksgiving cactus your grandma has owned for the past 50 years. Some of the foundational pillars of this recreation are reconnecting to nature, relaxation, stress relief, pride in oneself, not the LGBTQ plants kind, and feelings of accomplishment. Amongst these qualities, this new rare plant complex kind of slid under the radar, if you will, and became enmeshed with the conventional understanding of houseplant cultivation. The boomer understanding of houseplant cultivation, because nobody under 40 was at the garden shows I was at when I was 10 years old. People were like, what is this thing doing here? Ultimately, people stumble upon the houseplant community either directly through social media, or you buy a plant and you venture online for care instructions, and a magical short time later end up spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on plants you were never interested in to begin with. Going back to the bags, not the ones under my eyes. My cat has started screaming at the moon, like the literary foreshadowing of an impending malady. We can quite easily make a distinction between a Chanel bag and an off-season Michael Kors receptacle at TJ Maxx. I love TJ Maxx, by the way. I get all my pots there. I think most people of a middle-class persuasion would never even walk into a Chanel. So why is there a disconnect between rare plants and other luxury products? We've all seen the Dr. Phil specials where people in unhappy marriages break themselves, buying clothes, houses, cars, breasts, the good cocaine, three-ply Ecuadorian alpaca fleece toilet paper. Back to my derailed explanation. Due to the novel emergence of rare plants and not being exposed to them during our formative years, it's more difficult to see them as an unwarranted luxury purchase. As a result, people might be more inclined to spend on their greenhouse than their closet. Added bonus, you don't get ridiculed for overspending because most people around you know what a Cartier love bracelet is and not a car marble. Monetary anonymity lends itself to your variegated spending habits as long as no one has access to your bank account. And generally, if someone in the community sees you grossly overspending, they'll enable you to keep doing it so they can hopefully get a cutting at some point. I actually found an example of this in 2020 when we were in full-blown philodendron madness. I'd first like to say I'm not making fun of this person. I just thought we could discuss this post in an enlightening way, so I saved it. I was scrolling through Reddit on a balmy summer's eve, as I do, and someone posted a picture of a pink princess leaf cutting asking others if it was worth $128. Based on the current market value of pink princesses at Lowe's, evidently it was not. They purchased it off Mercari, and according to the post, they did not intend to buy it. They were just sending an offer for the plant and didn't think the seller would accept it. Let's examine this scenario further. I myself used to sell on Mercari. If you purchase something you no longer want, before it ships, you can request order cancellation. Now, it's the seller's discretion, but generally they will cancel the order because they don't want bad reviews or return requests. For all intents and purposes, I'm going to say that the person who purchased this did want to buy it in the moment. Ultimately, they divulged they were $128 short on groceries. Furthermore, they stated that their plant budget for the month was $25, supplies included, and that they didn't know what got into them. This scenario acutely validates my theory that people do not know how to approach rare plants in respect to their financial restraints. I'm sure there are more examples out there like this, not posted. Furthermore, I also remember selling a $30 Hoya on eBay and some lady messaged me asking if I could ship first class mail instead of priority mail because she was on a fixed income. I'm on a fixed income. And if you can't help me, I don't know what I'll do. Long story short, she did not buy the Hoya. The extra $3 in shipping was just too much. The $30 leaf was fine though. On to the next chapter of the video. 
if you will. Let us now dive further into the intersocial dimension of the community. As we previously discussed, this community spawned prior to 2020, but very much so compounded in popularity during the pandemic. I truly believe this is a consequence of spatial isolation between individuals during lockdown, consequently driving human interaction into virtual spaces. As a result of this dynamic, people put a disproportionate amount of social interaction needs online, for example, into the plant community. We're humans, and historically we've needed to work closely with one another and form strong relationships to survive. Today, not so much. We can work from home. That's what I'm doing right now. However, in prehistoric times, you could not hunt deer from the luxury of your own cave, nor could you order a flash frozen vacuum sealed deer from Amazon. All the paleo bros had to go out and hunt a mammoth, except me. I'm a vegetarian. You already know I wouldn't have survived past the womb. For this to transpire, mutual respect and cooperation must have existed within the group. And then they return with the mammoth flanks, the tenderloin, the brit. I don't know. Whatever cuts of meat you get from a mammoth. The women were probably so happy about the mammoth Wellington that they got pregnant and humanity continued. Contrary to the former scenario, my vegetarian, work from home, pathetic self, can just go to the grocery store and buy plant matter extruded in the shape of a hot dog and call it a day. We have modified our external world and society to be profoundly different. One thing we cannot modify is our brains. Having mutual respect, praise, and validation is no longer necessary for our innate survival. However, our brains are still wired to seek it. Being in possession of rare plants is a quick way to meet these needs. If you have the variegated oblique nodes, you are the Britney Spears of the Spokane rare plant buy sell trade group. But the problem is, once you're nodeless, you can't give them more. It's a shallow, unsustainable source of affection that requires you to keep pouring money into the rare plant vortex. Based upon our introspective Neanderthalic discussion, I have come to the conclusion that people are subconsciously equating rare plants to survival. This is potentially why the pink princess purchasing person was willing to plunge their produce pecuniary pool into a leaf. Remember everyone, there's a stark contrast between being edged out of a rare plant group and being alone in the wilderness. However, our ape brains have not delineated the difference. Now, I'd like to go back and further elaborate my statements about plants and stress relief. I usually leave some of my statements open to interpretation. I employ the words, I think, I feel, I believe, maybe, potentially, possibly, throughout this discussion because I want to express that these are my opinions or interpretations and not empiric evidence. I'm going to say this one with fair certainty. Rare plants do not provide stress relief whatsoever. I will now tell you how I arrived at this deduction. The interest in growing rare plants is ultimately external because definitionally, in the context of this community, a rare plant's exoticism and novelty hinges upon its commercial abundance. Nothing qualitatively within the plant makes it desirable. It literally depends on how many of them exist in the world versus how many want them. I bought this pinguicula, for example, because it is carnivorous. This is a real physical quality. There is nothing going on outside this house that can change that. I can see the fungus gnats in it. Let's say I bought this Hoya Wilbur Graves because it's rare. And I love rare plants. What a threshold my existence has permeated. But where is the rare? Where is it? Is it under this, oh, new growth? Is it under this leaf? How about the roots? Is it in the stems? Oprah, is it under my seat with a signed copy of Martha Stewart's favorite pastoral bed skirts of 2004? It's not because it doesn't exist. The, um, the, the rarity, not the, the pastoral butt skirts. And this is probably devaluing as we speak because people are propagating this faster than demand can accommodate. Let's dissect this. The very reason I purchased this plant is disappearing in front of me. And I'm now realizing I could have bought this for one eighth the price I did 
a year ago. There is no intense fanaticism encircling the plant's identity anymore. The effervescent and novel qualities of this plant, manufactured by a frenzy of people buying for it, have vanished. Now it's just a stupid horse plant nobody wants. It's like offing a stag after rutting season. I don't know what that means. There's nothing more demoralizing than having spent a disproportionate amount of time, money, and energy on a plant, only to find it now withering in mass on the begrimed floor of a Walmart supercenter in Michigan. In respect to what we just talked about, I've come to realize people don't understand the ephemeral quality of a given rare plant and believe it's a black and white concept, especially those that are new to the community. Whenever I Google is X plant, a lot of the times the first search result that comes up is rare. It's Hoya Wilbur Graves, rare. Even though that does not exist in the capacity that we employ said word, before they decide they're going to purchase it. Concurrently, I do recall the tectonic discourse amongst Reddit's rare plants buy sell trade sub regarding whether or not variegated string of hearts was still a rare plant after more nurseries began selling it. I still love you. For me, rarity was not of concern. She was never anything to me but a Serapegia woodii with achloral chimerism of a periclinal distinction in my botanical gaze. I'm going to give you my translation of the situation. I wrote it down. Let me ask you, is a variegated string of hearts still a variegated string of hearts? If it's true that a variegated string of hearts is no longer a variegated string of hearts, does it still belong in this sub? I try not to think too much about it. Back to the point of depreciating rare plants. Please raise your dexterous torso extension if you're not in denial. We love a dexterous torso extension. If you purchased a pink princess or an obliqua three years ago, and you still stand by your decision. Now look at your dominant arm, resting in a gravitationally demonstrative position. Speaking of stress, I forgot to talk about reversion. It's like an expedited process of devaluing your rare plant. Priority mail express to horticultural irrelevance, if you will. Now generally, this is a double-edged sword, more like a morning star, because they wouldn't be narrowly accessible if they had stable variegation that was transposable in a facile manner. And acknowledge many of these plants are comparatively worthless if they're unvariegated. For example, a small variegated Raphidophora tetrasperma goes from $1,000 to $10 if it fully reverts. 1% of what you paid for it, it is worth now. I don't know about you, but that seems kind of stressful and upsetting to me. And of course, you can intervene, but ultimately, it's mother nature, and sometimes no amount of despondent chopping and propping will bring the variegation back. I don't think anyone comes to this community with the masochistic intention of spending their security deposit on an anemic monstera. They enter this community because they're curious about houseplants, and then they get sucked into a vortex of variegation and insecurity. This rare plant fever can manifest with expeditious and unexpected veracity. For example, someone in the houseplant sub on Reddit made an inquiry concerning a $100 variegated peace lily and if it would be a good beginner plant. I think we know the answer. The top comment under the post was, I had to double check this wasn't our houseplant's circle jerk. This rare plant sentiment has even transcended into other communities. Another user asked if a $250 Nepenthes was a good first carnivorous plant. Guys, I have a question. Would a variegated Philodendron gloriosum be a good first plant for a beginner, novice, aspiring, soon-to-be leaf collector whose closest recollection of a live plant is a chicken Caesar salad? $25,000? Great, I'll just sell my house and live in an abandoned uranium plant. Now, there aren't any windows, but there will be enough residual radioactive activity embedded in the facility's walls to provide sufficient alpha radio luminescence. Everything, this may be eccentric, but one of my theories is that this community is an experiment conducted by extraterrestrial lifeforms, Mark Zuckerberg, in a pod of irradiated bottlenose dolphins to examine the spatial boundaries of hobby-based interrelational dependence from a homo sapial perspective. New sentence. With said statements, I just want to inform bewildered greenhorns and those already hopelessly amalgamated in the community to make informed purchases. If you're not wanting to participate in rare plants, just check in with yourself, ask yourself, 
why you're growing these plants in the first place. What brought you to this hobby? Maybe make a vision board? I don't know how that would help, but people keep telling me to make vision boards, so I'm going to force it upon you out of my sheer frustration. Remember, if someone tells you to keep buying plants because plants make people happy, just tell them that cats make people happy until you have 50 of them and you're on an a and &E special. If you have to gaslight yourself into being happy, you're probably not happy. Most of these hashtags are just a way to sugarcoat bad habits. Well, that's it. I hope I could kick some dust off of your subcranial depolarization units. In the theme of this video, if you'd like to do a fun activity, go take a tour of the rare plant graveyards at Walmart and Lowe's. Home Depot doesn't carry trending tropicals as far as I know, but I believe they're carrying the Pink Princess under another brand. Take it in, reflect, make it a spiritual journey. Consider being a patron or buying me a cup of coffee if I did more than shuffle leaves and tell you you need more drainage. Your soil should look like ambrosia salad. Lastly, remember Mises are just cuddly once. Let's say... Thank you for watching. This is my special trash can.